for tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday morning, 26, 1991. For more weekend teaching and deliverance camp meeting being held at some Bible campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dee Dee and Walter Fletcher are the ministries of the morning. There is such a sweet presence of the Lord here, you know, and the anointing of the Lord that rests here, here is just beyond expression, but it's glorious, wonderful, wonderful Jesus, wonderful. Dee Dee and Walter Fletcher are both going to minister this morning, and we'll just turn the rest of the morning service over to them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's all getting better. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love to praise His name, don't you? Amen. There's too many things in the world today getting the praise that should go to the only wise God. So every opportunity that we have, we praise His name. I want to talk to you just briefly this morning. We have heard much about other spirits, and we've been taking authority over them, which have been given to us as believers, and seeing relief come. But I just want to to talk to you just briefly in the word of the Lord this morning and songs that we were singing about the wind of the Spirit of God and what God is doing. He is doing a new thing in the earth. Can you say he's doing a new thing? life and I'm excited about the hour that we live in I I said that to you last night I'm excited that I don't live in any other day but today I'm excited about what I see Jesus doing in the body of Christ and it ever amazes me we want to as believers those who have walked the Lord for a number of times and you've seen different things happen in the church you say oh God can we have that Can there be an outpouring of your spirit? Well, I want to tell you today that there can be an outpouring of the spirit, but it's not going to be like it was in times past. God is doing something new in this hour and in this day, and he doesn't want you to try to lock him in a box and tell him what he ought to do. He just wants you to be an open vessel to receive what the Lord's about to pour out upon his people. Can you say amen? Amen. And I want to tell you today that the Spirit of the Lord is brooding over His people. There has been so much that has happened in the horizons of our life. Many of you, as well as I, have gone through times of devastation. We've gone through times of hurt. We have looked at situations that have happened in the church, and it has literally rocked our foundation. Amen. It has rocked people who we've looked to and believed in. And God has allowed this. I'm not saying that he did it, but he has allowed it that our focus and our attention might be taken away from men and put upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And say, God, I don't have any other recourse but to look to you because you are the only perfect one. You are the only example that I can look to. And we have an obligation to pray for those whom we've seen who have fallen. But yet we have to remember that the ministry as well as the people of God have clay feet. I need prayer just like you do. I have problems just like you do. I have hurts. I have just like you do. And many times we want to pump the ministry up and put them up on some pedestal where they don't have any place of being. Only God can be exalted. He is the only king. He's the only one that sits upon the throne. And every time you or I pump up one of these people, God comes and knocks them down, that you can see that they have clay. And he says, you began to focus in on me. You began to look to me that you might know the purpose that you might have in, in this life. I want you to go to Isaiah 61. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. I'm sure many of you can quote it. 
We also see in the book of Luke that Jesus came as he went into the temple and took up the scroll and began to read out of this same passage. But I come today as a servant of the Lord to challenge your heart. I come today to challenge you out of a place of complacency and to say to you, as Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I want you to say that. Read it with me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, most of the time we want to look at the spirit of the Lord is upon you and it's upon you. But I've come to tell you today that the spirit of the Lord is upon you. It rests upon you. Why? Because the Lord has anointed you. He's anointed you. I can stop right there and sit down and I don't need to say anything else. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. The Spirit of the Lord has come to you to challenge you today that because He's anointed you. He's calling you out of the place where you have been. I, I saw it yesterday and I could have prophesied it. The wind... The Spirit of the Lord is coming to challenge the people of God. And many of you have on a situation and you say, can these bones live? Is there any way that this thing can live? I come to tell you today that the Spirit and the wind of the Lord is blowing on the church today. It's coming and He says, yes, there can be life again. Why? Because I'm going to bring this thing together. I'm going to cause bone and bone put together. I'm going to cause to come. I'm going to cause there to be flesh to become upon the bones of the church. People have looked at it and they said, this thing isn't going to happen. I want to tell you that it is going to happen because God says, I'm going to have me a people. I'm going to have me a church and it's going to be without spot. It's going to be without wrinkle and it's going to be without blemish or any such thing. But God's after getting out the spots in our lives. There's two And what are you, women, you know what we do when we have spots on our clothes? We get the spot remover. And we put the spot remover on there. And maybe if you're like I am, I like to use some old-fashioned method. I get some felt and out the soap and begin to rub it on there. And rub that together. And then put it in the washing machine and let it go to work. Well, listen, God's in the business of rubbing out some of the spots that we have in the body of Christ. God's in the business of getting rid of the wrinkles that are in the church. Things that are wrinkling up what God has said is going to be perfect. And how do you get wrinkles out? You begin to apply the iron. You begin to put the heat on it. And you put a little pressure on it. Then it might get rid of those wrinkles. God says, I'm going to have me a people. And there's not going to be any spots. There's not going to be any wrinkles. Or any such thing. Now the such things are the ones that get us every time. It's the little foxes in Song of Solomon. It says it's spoil the vine. It's those little foxes that get in there and pull down what God's doing in the, in the life of the church. It says that Joseph was a fruitful bough whose branches went over the wall. And that's what God's about doing. He wants to see a vine that, gets, that begins to rise up. He is the vine we are. And you don't need any little foxes pulling in and tearing it apart. Amen. So all those little things in our life that we think, oh, that doesn't matter. I don't need to really deal with that. No, God's coming to me saying, no, I'm coming to deal with it today. Uh I'm coming to put my finger on it because I don't want any such things in your life. I want you to begin to walk in purity. I want you to begin to walk in holiness. I want you to begin to walk in uprightness and righteousness before our God. Isn't that the character of God? And that's what he's after in our life. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because he he has anointed us to bring Good news to the afflicted. Now, I want to tell you today that many of you have known affliction. It's come in many, many different ways. Maybe you've had affliction in your body. Maybe you you are having affliction in your family. And when I say that, I'm talking about dysfunctional families, families that are not whole. Maybe you have a situation that has afflicted you, that, that has caused you to not walk in wholeness. God said... That he has come and he's brought an anointing to bring good news. How many of you know the gospel is the good news? He's come to bring good news to those that are afflicted. And he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. 
I like that. And I'm sure the doctor will, will agree with me on this. You can see many things that are broken. And God's not in the business of doing patchwork. He's not putting on a band-aid, but he's come to bind us up. He's come to, to shear us, to shore us up. You know, many times there's, there's a brokenness that comes. There's a, there's a hurting. There's an affliction. And if that thing is not fixed and it even, if it isn't set properly, it will plague you for the rest of your life. You will always be catering to that place that has been broken. Well, listen, there's some brokenheartedness that's going on in the church. Many of you have had your heart literally broken. And you, you cried out. Do you know people die from a broken heart? They actually die from a broken heart. And there can be sickness that will be in your body because your heart has just hurt and it has ached so bad. And God says today that the anointing comes to break the yoke that have bound you and that you have known for a broken hearted. And he wants you to know that there's healing today. But you know, you and I can be released from all different kinds of spirits and everything else. But if we don't realize that there is a spirit that comes to replace all of those spirits that we have been talking about. Yes, right, right. Every which way I turned last night, after they told me that I was going to minister, I kept saying, God, what do you want me to minister? He said, I want my people to understand that I'm a God of restoration. He comes to restore. He comes to restore. And many times you say, God, my heart's been broken so bad. How can I ever be put back together? We sing that song as little Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, listen, we, we sing in that when we get to be older. Put your name in there. I sat on the wall. I had a great fall. Who can put me back together again? Jesus can put you back together again. The Spirit of the Lord comes to bind up your broken heart today. And where you thought that no situation and no psychiatry and no psychology and any of those other things, you can go and pay thousands of dollars and lay on the couch and tell them all your troubles and they still won't help you. Because God says, I've come, I've come to bind up your broken heartedness. I see every tear that you shed and I've bottled them up and I've kept them. And I am telling you today that I've come to heal your broken heart. I've come to bind it up where it's been so torn that you thought nobody understands my problem. Listen, I want to tell you that each of our problems are individual. No matter what I've gone through, it is not like what you've gone through. And they use and they have a saying that if you want to know how bad it is, you walk in my moccasins. Well, we don't walk in other people's moccasins, but I want to tell you something that God knows your problem. He knows your hurt. He knows where you live. He has your address. Don't you know if he knows that every hair that is on your head, if it's numbered, God knows what you've gone through. And so therefore he comes today to bind up your broken hearted. It says that he's come to proclaim liberty to the captives. And, and Doc talked on this yesterday that he's come to set the captives free. Do you know that there are things that can cause us to walk in a prison? And it will bind us, it will set us in, and you'll be in there looking through bars saying, how do I get out of here? But listen, there's a key. There's a key. It's the spirit and the anointing of the Lord. And it's a key and it's come to unlock those prison doors. And they're swung wide open today. And it says you can go free. You can go free. You can go free. For whom the sun sets free. Come on. He's free indeed. You all say that like you believe it. Hallelujah. He's set us free today. He's brought the key to set us free. And I love verse 2, it says, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. We were singing that this morning. This is the year of Jubilee. How many of you know what happened in the year of Jubilee? What happened? All the captives were set free. Oh, they set some of them free. All the captives were set free. Are you captive to anything? Are you captive to anything? All the captives were set free. The Spirit of the Lord. 
All right. All the debts were paid. Hallelujah. You got any debt? The year of Jubilee, where the debts were paid, where the land rested. Listen, the year of Jubilee has come for the people of God. Where the captives can be set free. God doesn't want his people in debt. He doesn't want you strapped in a place where you can't go free. That holds you in a prison. The, the favorable time of the Lord has come. The year of Jubilee has come. And if you read Leviticus 25, you'll begin to see all of what happened in the year of Jubilee. But I want to tell you that it's come for you. Don't read the book and not put your name in there. The word of the Lord is for you. The Spirit of the Lord has come to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to, pro to prisoners and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, I, got, I just got excited when I read that because I know that God is at work in doing a completed work in your life. So as the Spirit of the Lord has come to you, that you're going to go to other people. Are you hearing? Amen. It isn't just for us. We're not a blessing club. But God says what I'm doing with you, I am doing that you might go out. Yes, we get to be blessed. As the oil flows through the pipe, we get to be blessed. God's doing a mighty work in our life. But listen, you've got a neighbor next door to you. Is that neighbor in debt? Is that neighbor in distress? Is that neighbor in captivity? Is that neighbor all bound up, has a broken heart? God has let the Spirit of the Lord come upon you that you might go out and minister unto them. Amen. The day of vengeance of our God, it says to comfort all who mourn and to grant those and to grant to those who mourn in Zion. And I say there has been a mourning that has been in Zion. So much so that we have done like the children of Israel when they were in captivity. What did they do? They took their hearts and they hung them upon the willow tree. And they said, how can we sing the songs of Zion when we're in captive? Listen, God come today to set you free that you might begin to know he's put a new song Hallelujah. in your mouth. He's begun to put praise in your mouth again. And you can begin to sing the songs of Zion again. You can take your hearts down off the willow tree. Because he gives you a garland instead of ashes. Many times you say, oh God, this is an ash heap. What do we do with it? It says that he's given you a garland. He's put it around your neck. He's given you beauty for ashes. He's given you the oil of gladness for mourning. There have been times when I was under such great pressure and under such great stress. And I thought, oh Lord, what? What do I do from this point? I would lay down on my bed, and God would begin to put a song in my heart. And how many of you had that happen to you? And you said, huh, I can't sing this song. Where did that song come from? I can't sing it anyway. And it just keeps coming back again and again. And all of a sudden, you begin to just hum. And then it begins to take root in your spirit. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And then all of a sudden, you find your feet. You're patting your feet. And all of a sudden you say, hmm, boy, that feels pretty good. And then you find yourself, you're kind of skipping around. And then all of a sudden you're worshiping the Lord. You have moved from a place of praising Him into giving Him a sacrifice. Yes. And that's what He's after. We were talking about pouring the oil and the wine out. Let it be poured out on me. Do you know that that was poured out on the altar? And you have to become an altar for yes. God? Oh, my. You see, we don't want those hard places. But I want you to know that God's come for everything that the enemy has robbed you of. He's come to give you a garland instead of ashes. He's come to give you the oil of gladness instead of mourning. He's come to give you a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. I like that. 
I like that. Do you know when the prophets, when they were given a mantle, when that mantle was put upon them, the lot, when the mantle of Elijah, when he had that mantle, and he was known by the prophet who wore that mantle, when they saw, they knew that, he, that the, here was a prophet of the Lord. He was wearing the mantle. And all of a sudden, when Elijah knew that he was going to be taken up, he knew that he had to pass the mantle on to someone else. And so he took his mantle and he put it over Elisha's shoulder. And Elisha began to follow after the man of God. And I want to tell you today that God brought his mantle and he's put it in upon the church. He's giving you a mantle of praise. And it means that you're going to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. You're going to put your nose right up there and you're going to begin to praise when he says praise because he's putting his mantle of praise upon you. And listen, church, God is raising up a prophetic company of people that they're going to begin to praise the Lord in the midst of every situation. They're going to know praise. It's going to be in their mouth. And they're going to worship, worship, worship the Lord. Why? Because it becomes a part of you and it becomes a lifestyle. And you begin to walk in that thing every day that you live. Do you know when you're at home and you're cleaning your house that that can be worship before the Lord? When you're driving down the freeway, instead of doing something else, you can be worshiping the Lord. When you're cleaning the bathroom, those things we really don't like to do, you can be worshiping the Lord. Why? Because we began to learn what it means to walk in His presence. And that all comes by the Spirit of the Lord. And it's come to you today. No more fainting. No more just falling out under the pressure at all. But he's given the church a mantle. He's putting upon you a praise. So that you will be called oaks or trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. Why? That he, that he may be glorified. There's nothing like being the planting of the Lord. Nothing like being the planting of the Lord. It means that you're going to dwell by the stream. That you're going, to dwell, you're going to dwell where the water runs. You're going to dwell in a place where God can continually water you so that your root system can go down. And we, the church, can begin to have the foundation that we're supposed to. You see, it talks about the man in Matthew, I believe it is. It said that when the storms came, it didn't say if they came, but it said when the storms came, and it began to beat upon that house that it wouldn't fall because it was founded on a solid rock it had a foundation and god's after putting a foundation in the people of god for too long the people of god have no foundation we have seen it over and over again when we were in kentucky we had a situation that had no foundation you want to know what god did with it he brought his bulldozer in and he just tore the whole thing up and many times we're struggling, trying to put something together and say, God, can, we, can this thing live? And he's saying, it can live, but I'm going to put a foundation in it first. I'm going to put a, 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 a strong place in it so that when you begin to build upon it, it, it won't be top heavy. You know what I'm talking about. God's building a foundation yes. in the lives of his people. And we better have the word of God like we've never had it before. Yes. Amen. David says, I hide. I hide the word of God in my heart. I treasure it. That's what it means. That I river, I treasure that word of God so much that I'm going to put it, it's going to be a part of me. That I might not sin against the Lord. Listen, we don't treasure the word of God enough. We don't have enough words. You can never get enough words. You can never get enough word in you. So that you have a strong foundation in the Lord. I am convinced, I'm convinced that so many people go off into spurious doctrines and other things because they do not know what the Word of God says. Amen. And somebody comes along with some little thing and they begin to tell them about it and they go, ooh, that sounds good. And they come along and tell them another thing and they go, ooh, that sounds good. And then here comes another, ooh, well, let's go over here. This is what's happening. Ooh, let's go over here. Talk to them about it. God says if you get a foundation in your life when somebody comes with all their little droppings, you're going to say, there is something wrong with that. It doesn't line up with the Word of God. You know what I'm talking about? You cannot be a tumbleweed going here, there, and everywhere and eating out of every trough here and there. You're going to get sick every time. You have got to 
got to get in a place in God. I'm talking about being a tree now and, le- and being planted. You've got to get to a place in God where you're allowing the Spirit of the Lord to come and minister to you and that you're going to be a strong oak. You're going to be a strong oak. It's that when the winds come and they begin to, to blow, the only thing that it's going to do is make that tree stronger. Yeah. God's after building some stability in his people. This is a race of endurance that we're running. And every time, God's not after some spirit of fainting. But he wants you to begin to stand tall. It says in verse 4, it says, Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins, and they will raise up the former devastation, and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolation of what? Many generations. And strangers will stand and pass through your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers, but you will be called what? Priests of the Lord. Well, I thought that was for Brother and Sister Miller. Well, I thought that was for the Canada. They're the priests. They're the ministers. That's not what it says here, is it? It says you will be called. Priest of the Lord. And you will be spoken of as ministers of our God. And then you're going to begin to eat the wealth of the nation. Now we like that part. And in their riches you will boast. I love verse 7. Instead of your shame, you're going to have a double portion. Are you ready for your double portion this morning? The Spirit of the Lord is here to give you a double portion this morning. Instead of humiliation, instead of the humiliation that's been on the church, there's going to be a shout of joy all of their portion. I want to tell you something. When there was shouting going on in the camp of Israel, and it began to thunder forth, the nations began to tremble when they heard it. Why? Because they knew that God was in the midst of his people. And I tell you that God is in the midst of his people today. And the world is beginning to tremble. Because there's coming a shout in the body of Christ. There's coming a bringing together that you might have the double portion that's yours. You know the greatest thing that it said about Job? It was said, he said, consider the latter end of Job. You read all of that happened to Job, but it says, consider the latter end of him. Job got double. He got double for all of his trouble. And you think you're walking through some trouble? Listen, God says, I've got a double portion for you. I've got something that I want to pour on you that you're not going to, you're going to say, God, for me? And he says, yes, for you. A shout of joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in the land. And I love this. Everlasting. Everlasting. Say it with me. Everlasting joy will be there. Now you put your name in there. And say everlasting joy will be mine. If we serve a God that is from everlasting to everlasting to everlasting to everlasting. What does that mean? That he continues to pour out and pour out. Listen, joy is not determined by your circumstance. Right. I'll say that again. Yeah. Joy is not determined by your circumstance. And we look at the circumstances and say that will never happen. And God says, you're right, but I'm after bringing joy in your life. I want you to know joy, everlasting joy. For I hate robbery in burnt offerings, and I will be faithful to them that give me recompense. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring will be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the people. And all who see them will recognize them because of their offspring whom the Lord has blessed. I don't know about you, but I want to see a people raised up that are blessed of the Lord. And there is a producing that you and I do. I want to challenge you as you've never been challenged before, that the Spirit of the Lord has come to you. 
And that spirit replaces every demonic, foul spirit that we have called up, coughed out, spit out, whatever has happened, that it has left. I want to tell you today that the spirit of the Lord has come to replace that thing which had took, taken up residence in your life. The spirit of the Lord. And listen, Jesus said that when the spirit, when the helper has come, he's going to abide with you. In us. Not just with us, it's going to be in us. And you ain't talked about all the things that we're living in us. The Spirit of the Lord has come to take up residence in us. And it will light you. It will, as, as Carol says, it will begin to dynamite. It brings dynamite, a dynamo. It begins to, to, to stir you up. And many times there comes a stirring and you begin to try to squelch that thing down. I want to tell you that God is no more squelch. Don't you squelch. Don't you, don't you quench the Holy Spirit. But God is saying you let the Spirit of the Lord begin to bring the anointing, begin to bring that double portion of the outpouring of His Spirit on your life. That you might begin to see others set free. You don't just get to go free, but others get to go free. You don't just get to have your broken heart healed up, but now you're going to go and begin by the Spirit of the Lord to see somebody else, but see their broken heart healed. Yes, amen. It's for the nation. It's for others. There has to be a going out. And how will they hear except they be a preacher sent? And my Bible tells me that that's you. That you're the ones that should be go for us. I told the ladies yesterday, there are no more bench warmers in the body of Christ. God is calling every one of us. And we're so scared that God's going to shake us out of our personalities. Listen, God will use your personality, but the Spirit of the Lord will come and it will begin to change you into a place where there will become a boldness. I love Carol's testimony because that's what happens when the Spirit of the Lord comes. And every demonic spirit has to go. And when he comes in and he takes up residence, then you begin to go forth in his strength. In his power. He said that the word will be nigh you and leave it be in your mouth. I'll put the words in your mouth. I'm going to go before you and I'm going to prepare the way even before you get there. But what do we have to worry about? Nothing. We just begin to abide. We begin to rest in his presence. See, many times the church sees the rest and they say, that means I get to sit down. No, it doesn't. It means you just get to start to work. But there is a resting. There is a place of, of, of being in God. If you'll allow me to use this, there is a level of possession in God that you begin to rest in Him and you know that He has got every situation in control. And I want to tell you something. In the Church of America, we have not known what it has been to go through persecution. We don't know what that means. You only have to visit a third world country to see how Christians are persecuted. But listen, it's the persecution that has brought the people of God together. And I think we're going to see some persecution begin to come to the church of the United States. Because too many people are off doing their little thing here and doing their little thing there. I get so excited when God begins to bring the body of Christ together. Do you know he does not know what a Catholic is? He doesn't know what an Episcopalian is. He doesn't know what a a Presbyterian is. He doesn't know what a Baptist is. He only knows my church. And he says, I'm going to bring them all together. Many times we look at it and we say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. He says, that's fine because I'm going to. I'm going to bring my people together. But there's an excitement. We used to have wonderful times of fellowship with Episcopalians and Catholics who used to come to our services when we were in Kentucky. And they were as on fire for God. They used to dance and praise the Lord with us. They were as on fire for God as anything. Why? Because we serve the same Lord. And that's how God brings us together. We serve the same Jesus. And he brings us together. He is our common bond. Yes. So I challenge you today. The spirit of the Lord has come to stir you up. It has come to take you out of every comfort place where you've been. It's come to challenge you in your finances. 
It's come to challenge you in your churches. It's come to challenge you in your home. You see, we have put stock. We have put everything that we own in our bank accounts, in our houses, in our churches. And I don't have a problem with that. But it cannot be exalted above the Lord. We've got to get to a place in God where we know that the money is His, the church is His, the land is His, our kids are His, everything that we have is His. And I can rest in the fact that I know He has it all in control. And He will take care of every situation. And His anointing. His anointing is upon you today. Receive His anointing. Receive His glory. Can we just take a minute? Closing your eyes before the Lord. And saying, God, Lord, I realize that I need the Spirit of the Lord to begin to move in my life. God, I repent for squelching your Spirit. I repent for not moving when your spirit prompted me to do and to go. But I declare with my mouth today that your spirit has come and it's brooding over over me and my situation and my way places. And I thank you, Lord, that the spirit of the Lord Samuel in the 17th chapter, this being the year of Jubilee, this is your year of double portion, you realize that at the camp meeting, I love how God dovetails and puts his word together for us. So much God wants to say to the body of Christ, and like I was sharing with you the other night, God's not saying as much as many are saying he's saying, but he's saying a lot more than we want to hear. We need to dig our ear need to cry out unto God to let the Spirit of the Lord anoint our ear. We might hear what he's saying. You've got to understand whenever God says, hear my word, he also uh, implies heeding what he's saying. Amen. Some of us listen, but we don't hear. A lot of us have come to consider the will of God. We want to know it to consider it. Not necessarily to do it. <laughs> we want to listen to what God's saying, but we don't want to heed the call. Amen. Amen. I was in a church a couple weeks, two or three weeks back. And uh, while the worship was going on, I uh, caught a glimpse of a little uh, Christian magazine. And uh, from where I was viewing it, it looked like it said... Uh, Christian writes from the front line. Actually, the, the little headline for the article was a chaplain writes from the front line. And my uh, little uh, wheels in my mind began to turn. I thought, my, what a challenging, challenging thing that is to be a Christian writing from the front line. I wonder, are you a front line Christian? How many of you know that Paul was a front line Christian? He was always writing, giving us a report where the battle was the hottest. Amen. I ask you again, are you a frontline Christian? Do you like the battle? Do you like to be where the battle's the hottest? Hmm? Do you like to be a part of what God's doing? Or do you like to be a part of the crew that <laughs> enjoys the, the benefit of others? 
God needs some that are on the front line. God needs those that can write and tell us where the battle waxes hot and how we can get involved in the battle and how to call up others. Amen? And uh, we need that today. First uh, Samuel in the 17th chapter, uh, let me read verse 1 through 10 and share some thoughts with you this morning. First Samuel 17, very familiar portion to all of us. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Succoth, which belongs to Judah. They camped between Succoth and Essachah in Ephes Damam. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he also had bronze greaves on his legs and bronze javelins slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. How I many of you believe he was a heavy dude? And his shield carrier also walked before him. And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, me and draw up in battle array. Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. If I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might gather. A number of months ago, I was awakened about three in the morning. I heard these words ringing, give me a man. Now, three o'clock in the morning, it's time to want to hear from God, or anybody, frankly. <laughs> I rolled over and tried to go back to sleep, and yet I kept hearing these words in my spirit, give me a man. Give me a man. So finally, I rolled out of bed and went down to a little study and waited on the Lord. You know, of course, that these words come from Goliath here in this chapter. As he challenged the armies of God, as he challenged the people of God. But I want you to understand that the Lord helped me to understand that long before these words were rehearsed in the ears of Israel by Goliath. But I want you to understand that the Lord helped me to understand that long before these words were rehearsed in the ears of Israel by Goliath. As they were, they came as an echo from a distant past before the book of beginnings. How many of you know in the courts of heaven, Lucifer, the son of the morning, also echoed this cry? <laughs> For the Bible revealed that he was the covering cherub. He covered the very throne, the very ark, if you please, of God. He led the angelic host in praise and worship unto God. But the Bible says something happened. He was lifted up in pride and iniquity was found in him. And in this iniquity caused him to rise up in rebellion against God. We find in Isaiah 14, those five, I wills, I will arise, be like the Most High, I will put my throne above the throne of God, I will put my place in the place of the north. In other words, it isn't enough that I be the covering cherub and lead the angelic host in praise and worship to God. I want to be e plurable unum. I want to be number one. And the Bible says in his rebellion that he caused a third of the angelic host to go with him in his rebellion, resulting in God casting him out of the third heaven and consigning him to another region. We know today that Lucifer now is known as Satan or the devil, and those angelic hosts that went in rebellion are now known as devils or demons. How many are glad though one third fell, there's two thirds still standing at attention waiting to do the bidding of the Lord? God's intention, though, was not merely to cast Lucifer out of the third heaven, but to cast him out of the earth. And God said in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them have dominion, and let them rule, and let them subdue. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over everything that creeps on the earth. How many of you know that God wasn't hiding his plan from Satan? How do you know Satan heard what God had in mind? And we don't know, but we know that in being consigned to this region, that there was this sense that he had access 
to move about. We read of the book of Job, when the sons of God came together, that Satan also came there. And God said, what are you doing here? He said, I've been roaming to and fro all the earth, implying that I've been exercising my authority, my rule. I've been enjoying my dominion and kingdom down here. God said, have you considered my servant Job? Job. And I can just imagine Satan said, uh, excuse me, God, pull out his little black book and go down the list. No Job. He said, I don't have a Job on my list. He said, God, you've covered him up. You put a hedge about him. But let me get at him and I'll show you what he's made of. You know the whole story. All the troubles and problems and things. Job did not curse God. Job still magnified God. And as my wife said, God gave him double for all of his trouble. But I want you to understand that what took place in the book of Job was the battle of the ages. What began in the heavenly realm, in that third heavenly realm, if you please, continued to be ensued upon the earth. And we know that Job proved victorious and God continued to move forth. But I want you to understand today, beloved, that the battle of the ages is still going on today. Now, I've met many of you who've come to this camp for the first time. And, and perhaps you don't understand what's taking place in the earth. You don't understand what God is up to. I want you to understand that you and I have not volunteered, but we have been drafted, hallelujah, by the Spirit of God to be a part of an army that are involved in the battle of the ages. And you find right throughout the Word of God from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, where someone said from the book of, 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 of uh, generations to the book of revolutions, <laughs> there is a battle that is taking place. And we find many, many characters on the, on the drama of this battle of the ages that, that reveal this battle. Well, we have it here in the very familiar story, as we know, of David and Goliath. I want to talk to you about the battle of the ages briefly, and what God's up to, what the enemy's up to, how we might be a part of that battle and, 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 and pursue the battle unto the, the end. It's very interesting. We read concerning David in verse 22 in this battle that when David saw the battle, it says that he ran to the battle line and entered. He ran to the battle line and entered. He's a front line. Here's one who's on the front line. See? The battle of the ages. I want you to picture a drama here. The, the stage is set. The characters on the stage are very important. Each character here represent what God is doing and saying in our heart and life. You need to, as, as students, as serious students of the Word, please be aware of the characters. Be aware of what they do and what they say. It's prophetic. These things happen unto them as an example for us upon whom the ends of the age have come. How I many you know this is the end of the age? How I many you know that God lets us know what He's up to? For God's intention, I said, was not to rid merely Satan out of the heavens, but to rid him out of the earth. And when Satan saw the man... Whom God had made in his image and likeness. How I many you know every time he passed that man in the garden, he looked in the face of the man, and what do you think he saw? He saw God. And he said, My God, he's here. The one that cast me out of the third heaven has cast me has, has come down here. And what do you think he's gonna do here? And so he contrived some kind of way that if I can just mar the image. Of the man, I can keep my kingdom. So we find in Genesis 3, he, con he contrived a way to mar, to obliterate that image. And we know the story. We talked about that last night. But what he hadn't counted on, that when God approaches the man and the woman and God begins to enact out the curses, he says, I'll add a little addendum here to this curse. The seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And so down through the time and down through the ages, he wondered, every time a man-child came into the world, is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? So we have the battle of the ages here. Let's set the stage. The Philistines, the enemies of God, are on one side of the mountain. The people of God are on the other side of the mountain. The valley between them. First character, enter Goliath. Let me tell you about this man, Goliath. First of all, we discover in verse 4, he's described as a champion. 
Here is one who has been involved in many battles and proven victorious. He's a champion. Not only that, but we discover his name means an exile. One who has been disposed from his country for protracted time. Hmm? Are you out there? One who has been disposed from his country for a protracted time. That's what the Hebrew means, the exile. He is from Gath. Gath in the Hebrew means wine press. How many of you have read the end of the book and you discover that Jesus Christ is going to tread down his enemies in the wine press of his wrath? Yes. Not only that, but we discover his height is six cubits and a span. You go to the book of Daniel, and Daniel saw a great image. It was 66 cubits. Hello? Amen. I come to the end of the book, and we discover that the number of the beast is 666. How I many you see something here? Not only that, but we discover that he's covered from head to foot in brass. Brass often speaks of judgment, divine judgment. So here's one who is six cubits in height. Here's one who is disposed from a country for a protracted time, though he's been a, a champion and proven victorious in many situations. He is presently under divine judgment. Not only that, but he, his spear, the size of a weaver's beam, is made of iron. And iron in the Bible speaks of bondage. So here's one under divine judgment and one under bondage now. How many of you recognize that even when today, even in our courts, when a criminal is brought to justice and the, and the uh, judgment has been made, that sometimes the sentencing takes time? Though the verdict has been given, he's been found guilty. He has taken and, and put in a place of captivity until a verdict at a certain time will be brought forth. And here's one under divine judgment now. Who's in bondage now, but there's coming a day of sentencing. Amen. Amen. Let's see what is at stake here. What's at stake? And he comes before the people of God, and this is what he says in verse 9. Choose you a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. What's at stake? If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, come on, then you will become our servants and serve us. The issue here is whose kingdom is going to rule. What kingdom is going to have the ascendancy? And if I win, then you will serve our kingdom. But if I'm defeated, then we will serve your kingdom. And I want you to know, beloved, in spite of these spurious doctrines that are going on today, there are only two kingdoms in the world today. You're either in the kingdom of God or you're in the kingdom of Satan. You're either in the kingdom of light or you're in the kingdom of darkness. And there's no middle ground. Elijah told the people of God when they were trying to worship Baal and still serve God, he said, come on, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? He said, if the Lord be God, then let's serve him. And we've got to make a choice today. You cannot stand on the fence today because the battle of the ages is going on. There's always the danger if you stand in the middle of the road, you'll get run over from every side. You've got to make a choice today. What kingdom's going to rule and who's on the Lord's side? Come on, let him, let him come here. So he says, give me a man. Let me tell you, first of all, the man who's not fit for battle. First of all, the fearful man is not fit for battle. We've heard about that. You look at verse 11. And Saul and all Israel, when they heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 24. And when all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were Greatly afraid. The fearful man or woman is not fit for battle. God has not given us a spirit of fear. We heard that too, didn't we? But of power and of love and a sound mind. You remember when the children of Israel went out. Moses sent the twelve spies in. Twelve of them go out. They stay in the land of promise for forty long days. They come back. No harm had happened to them. They obviously had eaten of the land. They stayed in the land. They were secure in the land. But when they came back, ten gave a bad report. And the Bible says that fear began to infect the camp. I want you to know that, uh, that, that when fear begins to infect the camp, that's a spirit that, that, that comes. And they came and gave a bad report. 
and fear infected the camp. We've got to be careful of our words. We've got to be careful because out of our mouth, mouth will come uh, words of life or death. Amen. And those that love it will eat the fruit thereof. What do you say? Amen. But, the, but Caleb, the Bible says, still the people. And he says, Shh, don't say that. He said, God says we can go up and take this land. God said the land is for us. And I believe God. You see? They said, yes. The people of Tim said, yes, but. Yes, God is a land of promises. Everything God said it was, but. You've got to watch the buts on the end of promises because they will negate every promise in God. And Caleb stilled the people and he said, don't say that. He said, God said we're well able to take on the land. God says, as a matter of fact, though there are giants in the land, he said, God said these giants are bread for us. Amen. How many of you recognize that giants ought to be the breakfast of champions? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Turn to someone and say, giants are the breakfast of champions. He said they're bread for us. Piece of cake. The fearful man is not fit for battle. The second man that's not fit for battle is the people's man. Saul represented the people's man. He was head and shoulders above the rest. Head, of course, speaks of natural intellect, fleshly imaginations, our mind, our thinking, our way. Shoulders speak of natural power, the arm of the flesh. They wanted a king like all the other kings who could go out and do battle. But when the battle came here, when the battle was the hottest, and when things were at stake about the kingdom, the people's man was not fit for battle. And beloved, God is about removing the people's man in this hour. He's not interested in our intellect or lack thereof. He's not impressed by our shoulders above the rest. He's removing the flesh in this hour. Do you remember when Jesus was revealed? John the Baptist didn't know it, but he prophesied his own demise. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. How did it happen? Well, he was put into prison. That wasn't bad enough, but there came a day where John the Baptist, watch this, had to be beheaded. Do you know that Jesus' public ministry didn't begin to flourish until John the Baptist was beheaded? Why? Because God was saying, I'm not going to have two heads, there's only one head. And beloved, I learned long ago as a child, and anything with two heads was a freak. How many of you know we've got some freaks in the body of Christ? And each and every one of us need to cast down our imagination. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. For Ephesians says that Jesus Christ has been given unto us as the head of the church. And he alone is King of kings and Lord of all. Amen. Amen. We've got to be beheaded. We've got to cast down our imagination. We've got to say, Lord, I'm willing to be beheaded that he might be the sole head of the church and of my life. Amen. The people's man is not fit for battle. Jeremiah said, let not the mighty man glory in his, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories, glories in this. But that he understands and knows me. Relationship is what God's after in this hour. That I am the Lord who exercise loving kindness in the earth. And these things I delight. The people's man is not fit for battle. Then there's the carnal man. If you look with me to verse 30, uh, 38. The carnal man. And again we see this in Saul. And it says, And Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head. And he clothed him with his armor. And David girded on Saul's sword over his armor and tried to walk with Saul's armor. And but he had not tested them or proven them. And David says, I can't go with these for I've not proven them. I've not tested them. And David, come on, took them off. I want you to know the carnal man is not fit for battle. Saul, who had one, come on, he had won a few battles in that armor. But he tried to put his armor, you've got to hear this church, he tried to put his armor onto David who was willing to go to battle. And David couldn't go because that armor was carnal. David had not proven that armor. David had not fought in that armor. David had no victories in Saul's armor. And I fear today, beloved, that many of us are trying to walk in someone else's armor, someone else's anointing. And we're trying to go to battle in someone else's armor and anointing. And we are as, as clumsy as David with Saul's armor on. Amen. 
the carnal man, that competition spirit, that striving spirit, that, that jealous spirit, that competing spirit. Are you out there? How many of you recognize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal? They're mighty through God, though, to the pulling down of strongholds. The carnal man is not fit for battle. Well, who's fit for battle? My wife already begun tonight. The spirit man is the only man fit for battle. And David represents the spirit man. This is a marvelous type. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most marvelous pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have all in the, all the word of God. David represents the spirit man. Let me tell you about David. Why did David even wind up in the battle? Well, he, he, he came to the battle because the father had sent him to look upon the welfare of his brethren. Yes. You read there quickly, please. And David rose early. His father told him, verse 17, take now... For your brothers, an ephah of roasted grain, and ten, these ten loaves of cheeses, run to the camp, run to the camp of your brethren. And David rose early in the morning. He left the flock with the keeper, took the supplies, went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp where the army was going out in the battle. Verse 22, and David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line to enter in order to greet his brothers. David represents the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know the Father said unto the Son, I want you to go down and see how the battle's going on. The cry has gone out, give me a man. And your brethren need help. <laughs> Come on. How many of you know he left the courts of glory? He left everything in charge of the Father with the Spirit of the Lord. He came down to look upon the welfare of his brethren. For the Bible says that he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Why? Because he wanted to bring many sons into the glory. He said, I will sing in the midst of my brethren, will I sing and proclaim thy name. Yes. David came down to look upon the welfare of his brethren. And Jesus wrapped himself in humanity to come down to look upon the welfare of his brethren. Not only that, but David, when he got a little closer, he heard that the king would reward those who won the battle. First of all, he heard that the king had a bride. Hmm? He said, what shall happen for the man who fails this giant? The king has a bride for him. Yes. And don't you know that Jesus Christ is coming, came into the earth that he might receive a bride unto himself without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing? I want you to know he's not coming for a child bride either. <laughs> She's going to be fully developed. She's going to be fully matured. She's going to be what he is. Amen. Come on. Amen. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. The king had a bride. Thirdly, he heard that the king had great riches. Hmm? The king's got great riches for him that wins this battle. And don't you know Paul prays for the believers that the eyes of their heart might be enlightened, that they might understand and comprehend what is the hope of his calling and know what are the riches of the inheritance in the saints. Father has riches. Not only that, he heard that he who wins this battle, his family gets to go free in the land. Hallelujah. And he's come to set the captives free. We've been just enjoying and reveling here in the camp meeting about the freedom and the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. Because often our problem isn't the fact that Jesus uh, work on Calvary's cross. It isn't the fact that we recognize that sins have been dealt with. Often our difficulty is standing fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And not getting entangled again in that yoke of bondage. I want you to understand that Jesus came, that he might set us free. And in setting us free, keep us free. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The spirit man. David represents the spirit man. Let me tell you something about David. David was anointed. But he was also proven. Hear me, saints. David represents the spirit man. He was anointed and he was proven. And if we can understand this today, that many of us fail not because of the anointing in our life, but we don't prove that anointing. The reason that David could take off Saul's armor, the reason David could take off everything that Saul had given him, because he recognized that God had anointed him and there had been a proving in his life of that anointing. We discover that David was not just anointed once, but he was anointed three times. You know, he was anointed first by Samuel. Amen. 
And then, of course, he ran out because of Saul's running after him. And then we find out when David was brought to the kingdom, only Judah originally accepted him. And so they anoint David. That's the second anointing. And then when all of the people of God came together, Israel and Judah came together, then David was anointed a third time. And beloved, I believe there's a third anointing coming upon the people of God. And I believe it's flowing from the head coming down upon the body in this hour. Amen. But if you're going to be a part of the battle, if you're going to be the man that God's looking for in this hour, you've got to be anointed and proven. David could say to Saul, I don't need this because you read in verse 37, he said, The Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, and he'll deliver me from the head of this Philistine. Amen. Now, 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 here's something you got. and You want to shout about something. More often than not, the place of the proving of the anointing is closest to home. The lion and the bear were closest to home. Are you out there? Amen. If you'll be honest, the lion and the bear, the place of the proving of the anointing is closest to home. Family relationships, marriage relationships, things on close to home, the job and other relationships. That anointing will be proven, beloved, by the paw of the lion, by the paw of the bear. What are you going to do with them? Hmm? David knew he could take this giant, it was a piece of cake, because he had proven that anointing by taking on the lion and the bear, which was closest to Father's home. Hmm? You discover that too in your life if you're going to face the giant. Don't face the giant. Don't dare try to face the giant if you haven't dealt with the lion and the bear. Come on. We've got to have that anointing, and God will prove it there. Amen. Somebody said, if it don't work at home, don't export it. Huh? Come on. David represents the spirit man. Hallelujah. David takes the staff in his hand when he takes off this armor. And that staff, beloved, was not to represent, remind David of the fact that he was a shepherd. But what David was saying by taking that staff was that the Lord was his shepherd and he shall not want. You see, he didn't need that carnal armor or the people's armor or the fleshly armor. He recognized who his armor was. The Lord our God is a sun and a shield. The Lord is a strong man of war. And when David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. One translation says, the Lord's my shepherd. I like nothing. Now get this. God doesn't merely have what you need. He is what you need in this hour. Moses said, oh Lord, how are the people going to believe that you sent me? And God said unto Moses, tell the people, I am. Who shall I say send me? Tell them I am. Moses, I don't need a name. How I many you know when you're the only one, you don't need a name? Amen. Tell them I will be to them whatever they need me to be when they need me to be it. I want you to know God will meet you where you're at. He is what we need. And David took that shepherd to rem staff to remind him that the Lord was his shepherd. He shall not want. Yea, though he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. He even got that valley there between the Philistines and Israel. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's just a shadow. Come on. How I many you know we pass from death into life? Come on. Hallelujah. But quickly, David doesn't take the staff and first of all head for the giant. He heads for the brook. Hello? I mean, you know, David didn't look around for a pond, some stagnant well, but he got by the brook. You've ever been by a brook? You see the brook babbling and flowing, pure, fresh, cool water. And I believe that brook represents the washing of the water of the Word of God in our life. It wasn't the first time David had been by that brook, but I believe David again and again and again was down there by that brook. And the water of the washing of the Word was doing something in his heart and life. And David doesn't, when he gets down by the brook, he knew something was in the brook too, didn't he? You see, he, when he gets down by the brook, I mean, you know that, that David didn't just reach around and look on the ground for a few stones. No, the Bible says he reached over in the brook and he got out five smooth stones. My daughter was down by the uh, uh, stream there uh, yesterday and she brought me back a stone. You know those stones look a little different than those that are on the ground. I mean, you know that when, those, when, the, when the water has, has gone over those stones in the brook, it washes away every bit of debris. It gets rid of every jagged edge, and it makes it smooth and ready for the master's use. And David knew that something was in the brook that had been proven, even as his own life had been proven. He doesn't take one or two, he takes five. <laughs> How do you know those five stones represent the fivefold ministry? Watch this. David takes five, these five smooth stones, and he puts them 
in the shepherd's bag. Somebody said it's in the bag. <laughs> you want to know where the victory is? It's in the bag. It's in the shepherd's bag. And I want you to understand in this hour, the great shepherd has gone down in the brook and he's found men and women of God who've been proven by the anointing and proven by the washing of the word and the dealings of God. And he's taken them out of the brook and he's putting them in the pouch in this hour. Because he alone as the shepherd knows which stone will fail what giant. Hello? We don't just want the pastor and the evangelist today, though we need them. We need the teacher. We need the apostle. We need the prophet in this hour. Because the great shepherd knows what ministry is needed at what time in your life, in your congregation, in your situation. To speak to that situation. To direct that stone to where it will hit its mark and fail the giant. So he puts it in the shepherd's pouch and now he's ready. The Bible says he races toward the giant. Now he's ready now. And please notice that David, when he comes toward this giant and he's racing toward him, he doesn't aim for the Goliath's armor bearer. He doesn't aim for Goliath's chest or legs. He aimed for his head. How do you know when David threw that slingshot and that stone hit Goliath in the head, he had a lot on his mind? Some of you got it. Oh, me. He had a lot on his mind right at that time. But I want you to understand something that's so marvelous about this story. And I wish I had time to really get into it. Please notice that when that stone hit Goliath in the head, you think he would have fallen backwards, but he didn't. The Bible says he fell on his face. Doesn't the word of God tell us there's coming a day when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father Almighty? He fell on his face. I want you to see that. And David comes upon him and he takes Goliath's own sword and he cuts off his head, thereby fulfilling Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent there. Hallelujah. You know what happened. And the head rolled off of that giant. And all of Israel, which were afraid, that spirit of fear was broken. The, the power of it was broken. The anointing had broken that. All of them began to rally for the fight. And I want you to understand something in this hour. God needs a frontline people. God needs a van, vanyard, vanguard company to go before that which gathers in the rest. Amen. And God is raising up a people who will fail the giant, who will cause the head of the, the giant to fall off, that all the people of God might gather hmm, to the battle. Amen. And run to the battle. Well, quickly here, we know that, as I've already said, David represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's answer to give me a man. He was God's answer to give me a man. For the Bible says that there is but one man, the man Christ Jesus, that God sent into the earth. Amen. To reconcile you and I to God. But not only that, 1 John 3, 3 8 tells us. That uh, he who practices sin is of the devil. He who practices sin is of the devil. But for this cause, the Son of Man was brought into the earth that he might destroy the works of the enemy. And so God's answer to give me a man is the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. But I want you to understand today, God's answer is still the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's in a many-membered man at this hour. Hallelujah. Go with me to Luke 10. I want you to see something. Luke chapter 10. Are you still with me? Luke chapter 10, verse 17. We're familiar with this, but I want you to see something here. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says unto them, Yeah, I knew it. There's, you know, can you just see him just kind of... No, I don't think he did that at all. I think he was rejoicing with them. Amen? He said, I was watching Satan fall from heaven, from heaven, like lightning. How fast does lightning fall? <laughs> For you can snap your finger, right? It's as if it were Jesus sent these 70 out with authority that in the name of the Lord, taking authority over the demonic realm... As they used that name, blind eyes were opened, the dumb began to speak, the deaf began to hear, the lame began to walk, come on, the lepers began to be cleansed in the name of Jesus, and they come back reporting with joy, 
Lord, that even the demons are subject to us in your name? He said, I was watching. It's as if it were he was sitting in the, in the arena watching them. He was watching this battle take place. And the same one that cast, was cast out of heaven there in the third realm was cast out again and again and again out of the lives of those who have been bound by nature's night and the powers of darkness when the name of the Lord was used. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He fell again and again and again and again from that, just, that, that, that place. He's a squatter. How many of you recognize he's a squatter? Yeah. Now, Jesus said, and this is the context by which we quote it, Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon the serpents and the scorpions and over all, say that with me, over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this is the interesting thing to me. If Jesus Christ gave those 70 and the 12 before that, that type of authority and that type of power before Calvary's cross, how many of you believe after Calvary's cross there ought to be more? Hallelujah. Hmm. He gave them authority. Amen? Quickly go with me. Let's wrap this up. Romans 16 and 20. And while you're turning there, how many of you recognize that God is anointing a man in this hour? How many of you know that he's not just anointing a head, he's anointing a body? For the Lord said unto my Lord, Psalm 110, Sit thou down at my right hand until I make all thy enemies a footstool for thy feet. I used to be a corpsman in the medical field, and I learned in my anatomy course that my feet were not attached to my head. They're a part of the body. And you are a part of the body of Christ. And the feet are attached to the body. And the anointing is flowing from the head and is flowing down to the body, even down to the feet, that the enemies of the Lord might become a footstool for his feet. Yeah. Hallelujah. Romans sixteen twenty. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Paul got a revelation of this. He was the, the, the last in that particular age of the apostle who had seen the Lord, but he saw him after the other disciples. He wasn't with that other company. And this is the revelation he brings to the believers, to the Gentile believers, to the Roman believers here. And he says, And the God of peace will soon, come on, crush Satan yes. under sure. your feet. How many of you believe that? Amen. How many believe we're going to do some tap dancing on the devil's head in this hour? Amen? The battle of the ages, beloved. And you are that one new man that God has raised up to answer the call to give me a man. To, to fail the giant. To crush the head of the enemy. And to cause him to flee as he's only he has to do. Amen? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. When I stand on the name of Jesus, tell me who can stand before. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, we have the victory. Amen. Let's stand together and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your anointing, Lord God, and what you're doing in this hour, O oh God. We thank you that you're making us, Lord God, joint of your joint, bone of your bone, a part of the body. Even as Ezekiel saw that army, Lord God, that's had the breath put in it, an army going forth to conquer in the name of the Lord. Oh, Jesus, we come before you. Father, we ask that everything that's flesh in our lives, Lord, we cast it down. Everything that's our carnal imagination and the weapons of carnality, we cast them down. Lord, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. We recognize it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And Father, we want to trust that anointing in this hour. We want to trust that anointing in this hour. Lord, to fail the enemy and to send the enemy flying. And like lightning, he'll be cast down again and again. Help us to crush the head of the enemy, Lord God, we pray. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I wonder could we sing that song, In the Name of Jesus, In the Name of Jesus. I think that would be very appropriate. Amen. Hallelujah.
I hope you get that down in your spirit. But it becomes a living part of you. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in his name we are victors. Yes. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the Shekinah glory of the Holy Ghost to flow and move amongst us. And we thank you for the angels of the Lord that are praising and worshiping with us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing them to come and be present in this place. We praise you for it today in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for your presence at the rest of the services of this, uh, of this time. And, Father, we thank you for going with all of those that have tra had to travel today uh, and will yet travel before the day's over. We thank you for your protection over them, the joy of the Lord to be their portion. And Father, we thank you for the food that's prepared for us now. We bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. Dot com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.